And thankful for an incredible time of worship. And we're going to continue in that now as we turn to God's word. I, I mentioned earlier that one of the ministries as a church we're involved in this coming week is a preaching conference. And as we talked about this Sunday leading up to before the preaching conference, Pastor Jarrett said, hey, there's you know a bunch of guys from church plants that we partner with that are going to come in. And, uh, and attend this conference. Are there any from this conference that you want to come and speak at Edward Klein, you know, the Sunday before? And I said, absolutely not. And he's sort of shocked. I was like, wait, what, what, what are you saying to me? And I said, but there is, if I got to have anybody that's a part of the conference, one of the teachers of the conference that's coming in, a guy named Dr. Chris Osborne, and he's going to be teaching at the conference. He's one of the professors of teaching and preaching at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's been a pastor in Texas for over 40 years, and he was my pastor when I was in college at Texas A&M University. He was the pastor. There's one. Any more? Any more Aggies? There? Okay, there's a few. There we go. Good. I wanted to give you the chance if you want to take it up. Uh, but anyway, he was a pastor at Central Baptist Church in College Station uh, for, for many years, and he was the pastor while I was at A&M, and he was my pastor for three years, and uh, just sitting under his teaching every single Sunday morning was an incredible blessing, and so when uh, Talk to the Chair about it, we jumped at the opportunity to have him here, and uh, thrilled that you're going to get to learn from him this morning. I want to encourage you, uh, and if, if you take notes, have your pen ready. Uh, man, there, there's a lot of, of good stuff this morning and praying that God would move and work in our hearts uh, this hour as he did the first hour. And uh, so anyway, with all that being said, would you guys give a warm welcome to Dr. Chris Osborne as he comes to, to bring the word this morning? So I told that 930 service, I knew need to get one thing off my chest. I am a Texas Rangers fan. <laughs> I know, come on, man, you're killing us. You're killing us. The minute Altuve got up the other night in the ninth inning, I said, oh, man, he's liable to wham, knock it out. But at least he's a classic guy, so if we're going to lose, I don't mind losing there. That's a lie, but at any rate. Uh, I want you to turn to Revelation 5. I don't want you to get all excited. We're not going to talk about the Antichrist today. Uh, Really, we're looking at one of the few chapters I actually understand in Revelation. I preached it three different times, three different churches, and came out with three different views. So that should tell you what I know. But Revelation 5, I pretty much understand. We're not going to talk about the Antichrist. The rumor is he's already in the world and that several years ago he bought the Dallas Cowboys. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that's true because theologically the Bible says that the Antichrist is successful all the way to the return of Jesus. So we're pretty sure it's not Jerry. Uh, we have Aggies then here? <laughs> Man, I pastored there 33 and a half years, like doing mission work. I'm an Alabama fan, so it was quite entertaining. Somebody asked me one time, said, do you guys do a lot of evangelism at A&M? And I said, we don't do any evangelism. Because all Aggies go to heaven. I, it's, it's true. I, in 33 and a half years of pastoring there, I never met an Aggie. I thought he'd reached the age of accountability. So they all, <laughs> they all go. <laughs> Revelation 5. I don't pastor here. I won't get any emails, so I'm good. <laughs> Revelation 5. Probably one of the greatest chapters in the entire Word of God, and I don't say that lightly. <clears throat> if I were you, I would read this once a week just to remind myself. Now, it's filled, it's a narrative, so it's filled with all sorts of uh, metaphors and everything else. We're going to have to work through it. I I'm pretty fast, so we're going to walk through it. But it is one of the most powerful statements of Christ you will find in the entire Word of God. Here's where he starts. I saw on the right hand of the one sitting on the throne a book written within and without, sealed with seven seals. Now, so he says a couple of things there, right? He says God's sitting on his throne, which means what? He's all powerful. Literally, there is nothing he cannot do. That's the whole picture of him sitting on the throne. Now, he has a book in his hand. Written within and without, it doesn't mean anything to us, but it meant something to them. 
It was something that we, that John, he's holding it out to John. It was something John had lost that God wanted to give him back. Now, we know what it is because when the seals start getting broken in Revelation, two things happen. Evil is eradicated and God restores the universe to the way he meant for it to be for us. What he meant for Adam and Eve and for the, what he meant for us, the restoration comes when this book is open. So it's in his right hand. It's his inheritance. It's what he wants us to have back. So he's offering it to John. Now, what he's offering is what Adam and Eve lost that God wants to give us back. Now, God was very clear. He told Adam and Eve, the day you sin, you'll die. Now, that didn't mean they would cease to exist. Nobody in the image of God ever ceases to exist. But it did mean four things would be true about them now that were not true prior to that. So after Genesis 3, four things are true. One, their relationship with God is broken. They're booted out of the garden. God stays. They used to walk with him in the cool of the day. That's over. Their relationship with him is completely gone. So the purpose for their existence is lost. And their relationship with the creator is gone. Number two, the relationship with each other is broken. When Adam is confronted by God, he says, the woman you gave me, he blames her and doesn't even name her. So the relationship, we see this, this is what's going on in Gaza. We are a people that just simply are broken. We cannot get along. And so there's a brokenness now in the universe between us. The world is now inhospitable. It was going to be this great place to live, but now when they step out, it's broken. It's butchered. And so we encounter all the horrible things that we do in this world. It's broken. And Adam and Eve are broken. For the first time in their existence, they know shame, guilt, inferiority, depression. They know all the things we face now because they have sinned. So they're not going to cease to exist. So God has to boot them from the garden. But what he's doing now in Revelation, he's got his right hand out book in it. It's not in the bookshelf. It's not behind his back. He's got this book out that if it's opened, we get back what we lost. And so here God has got it in his right hand, offering it to John. Now, of course, here's the key question, right? Why doesn't God open it? It's completely sealed, seven seals. So God's on his throne. He's all powerful. He's offering the book to John, so why doesn't God open it? Because he can't. He's the one that sealed it. He told them, the day you sin, you will die. If he opens it now, and he's going back on his word, he's violating his own character. He promised them, if you don't sin, you will not die. If you do, you will. So if you sin, you're going to die. So if he opens his book and removes the consequences of that sin, what he's basically saying is, I don't really have any integrity because what I say, I don't mean. So he cannot open this book without violating who he is. And yet, he obviously, by holding it in his right hand to John, obviously desires for John to have it but he can't open it so here we go in verse 2 I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice who's worthy to open the book and to loose its seals and nobody was able in heaven nor upon the earth nor under the earth to open the book not even to look into it so he sends this angel out all through the universe he comes back and says there's nobody there's nothing, which means you and I and John are going to stay permanently in the mess we're in. There's an old adage that says, if you don't know Christ, this is the only heaven you know. If you know Christ, it's the only hell you know. But this world is what we're going to live in for eternity. 
And so it says, John, I was weeping bitterly, continually, because there was nobody found worthy to open the book or even look into it. Absolutely. He's now sitting there looking at this. God's got something he wants to give him. He can't, and there's nobody else that can open it, and he realizes, I'm stuck in this mess, and he's overwhelmed because he literally has no hope. He's destroyed. But in the middle of his weeping, verse 5, one of the elders said to me, stop crying. Behold, the lion has conquered, the one from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He's able to open the book and its seven seals. So one of the elders steps up to him. Now listen to what he says. He says, stop it. It's okay. Lion, Jewish, like King David, is coming. So if you're John now, kind of wiping off the tears, okay, they did find somebody. There is hope. So you're waiting for the next scene, for the, for the curtain to open and to see what's there, and you're expecting a, fero a, a ferocious Jewish king, power, royalty, regal, strong, majestic. So the curtain opens, and here's what he sees. I saw in the middle of the throne and the four living beings, in the middle of the elders, a little lamb standing as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. So the curtain opens, and it's not some great ram. He sees this little lamb. And as he looks at it closer, he looks at it, and it's standing. But somebody's killed it. So he's, mind's got to be swirling, Right? He's expecting a, a, a majestic Jewish king. Instead, he sees this little lamb. Somebody killed. And yet it's alive. And then when he pays attention to it, now his mind's blown because it says two things about him. He has seven horns. Horn always in the Old Testament. A symbol for power. So this lamb is all powerful. And with the seven spirits of God, he's all knowing. So now if you're John, you're facing the question, if he's all powerful and all knowing, how did he die? You can't overpower him. He's all powerful. You can't sneak up on him. He's all knowing. And yet, clearly, he's been dead, but he's alive again. And lambs are not suicidal. So this lamb must have willingly given its life up for some reason. That is precisely what we see in Jesus Christ. When they came to get him, Thursday night, big mob. There's Peter, always Peter. Grabs the sword out, swings, misses the head, cuts the ear off. Jesus reaches down, puts the ear back on Malchus's head. And he looks at Peter and he makes this statement. He said, put the sword back in. If I wanted to, I could call my father and he would send 12 legions of angels. So you understand what he just said? A legion in the Roman Empire was anywhere from five to 7,000 men. In the Old Testament, one angel in one night killed 186,000 men. So what Jesus just said to Peter is, I'm not going because they've overpowered me. I'm not going because the Romans are conquering me. I'm not going because the Jews said this. I'm going because I choose to go. His death was absolutely voluntary. Now, why would he do that? 
Why in the world would he voluntarily, he who created life, who's the author of life, why in the world would he go to this? Look at what it says. He says, and he came, and he took from the right hand of the one sitting upon the throne, and when he took the book, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden vial full of incense, which is the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to open its seals because you were slain and you have purchased back to God in your blood from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's why he died. Because Jesus in, on the cross in six hours, nine o'clock to three o'clock on Friday, He purchased our redemption. The Bible says he tasted death for every man. He went through all four aspects of death on that cross. The world, is it in hospital? Absolutely. He's bleeding. He's broken. He's shot. He's thirsty. He's dehydrated. It's, it's in a broken world. Is he rejected? When he dies, there's one person that believes in him. Only one when he dies. His disciples don't believe in him. We know that because they don't even show up at the resurrection. When he's told them over and over and over and over, I'm coming out of the grave on the third day, they're not there because they don't believe. He literally died rejected by an entire planet. One person bought into him. Is he rejected by the Father? First statement he makes on the cross, right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Last statement, three o'clock. Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. But right before three, he says, my God, my God, still is God, but not his Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. He loses his fellowship in some sort of way with the Father. And for the first time, as with Adam and Eve, he knows sin and guilt in the garden. He said, Father, let this cup pass from me. He took every bit of my shame, my sin, my guilt, my embarrassment, everything you have, and he literally drank it for six hours hours. He now knows guilt and shame. He drank hours. So he does taste death for everyone. And in that shed blood, he's buried. As we see in this lamb, he's resurrected. Why is that so important? Because everybody that dies, we go into the ground. We don't come back out. You say, Lazarus came back out. Yeah, but he went back in. Jesus came out, didn't go back in because he didn't die for his sin, he died for mine. So he purchased out of his blood our redemption and he did it voluntarily. Nobody took his life. Nobody killed him. He came here and gave himself up for us. And therefore, he's able to take the book and begin to open the seals. And what happens when he does that? Look at this. <clears throat> Number one, you have the harp. For the first time, melody is restored to the universe. Since the death of Christ, we can now sing in our hearts with reason. Incense, prayers of the saints, we now are back in connection with the Father, and we can pray to him, and he can honor and hear our prayer. And then he says, look at this. And he made them to our God a kingdom and priests, and they shall rule over the earth. It makes us a kingdom. So now we have a king in the church. You're just saying King Jesus, absolutely. How do you know if he's your king? How do you know? <clears throat> There are two things 
that I think will be true in your heart if, you really, if he's really your king. If I grasp this chapter, I don't mean intellectually, but if I grasp it in my heart, I really get what's going on here. There are two things that will be true in my life. I will hate what caused him to die on the cross. I will hate the sins I commit that drive him to the cross. I will hate them. But number two, I will crave the holiness in his life that qualified him to die on that cross. I will hate my sin and crave his holiness. That's how you know he's your king. If you don't hate that and you don't crave his holiness, you may be a believer, but somehow you've lost him as king. So that's kingdom. Then he says we're priests. That is our job. Now, don't shoot the messenger. Our job is to stand between God and the world as his priest. So our job is to step into a culture of people that are dead and to say, listen, we were dead too. But we found an amazing life that's restored connection with the Father, melody in our life. We can sing with purpose. He's given us back something that you can have as well as we have because there's nobody that doesn't have the capability of coming to the Father through Christ. So, <clears throat> now listen. I believe in being involved politically. I believe you vote. I believe you stand for truth. I believe you vote for truth. I believe you stand and correct on what God says morally in every way. <laughs> but the church's purpose is not to make America great again. Our purpose is to make America understand how great Jesus has always been. Amen. That's our call. Amen. And so our priesthood isn't related to political agendas. It's related to our Savior. And then he says, and they shall rule upon the earth. It is true. Revelation indicates in other passages we're going to rule with Christ. I don't know what that means except one thing I'm sure of. When I get to heaven, I'm tall. <laughs> Things are going to be fixed there. Amen. In the Bible, all the tall people are bad, Saul and Goliath. All the short people are good, Paul and Zacchaeus. So I'm just telling you, when we get to heaven, this thing's reversed. So those of you that are tall, it's over for you <laughs> when we get there. That's all I'm saying. So we're going to rule with Christ, and he's going to fix all that mess. Now, but then he says, look at this. And I saw and I heard the voice of many angels encircling the throne and of the living beings and the elders and their number was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, who, the, the lamb is worthy. Who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. And every creation in the heaven, upon the earth, under the earth, and all the things in the sea. I heard them saying to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb, Blessing, honor, glory, power forever and ever. And the four living beings said over and over and over, amen. And the elders fell and they worshiped. Amen. Yes. Amen. So, real worship is centered in Christ. Nothing else. I don't think you try to worship. I think you try to see Christ. If I see him well, worship is consequential. And I really appreciate this church. I know this is going to sound, you're going to go, what's the big deal? But it's a big deal that you do and you don't know. You have two worship services and they're the same in worship as one to the other. I've been in hundreds of churches that have a contemporary and a traditional and this and that. When Sunday mornings worship, 
the style is more important than the Savior, then we don't understand worship at all. So when Jesus Christ is the center of worship, instead of the style of worship, you're where you need to be. So we have this great Savior. So two things today. If you have never met Jesus, he literally is the only hope you have. And he willingly gave himself. Vance Haber made a statement one time, and I think this is just brilliant. He said, how do you say no to the Jesus who said yes to the cross? How do you do that? So if you've never met Christ, there's going to be some staff back here in the prayer room, but they'd be glad to share with you how to do that. For those of you that do know Jesus, you can pray, you can sing, hate sin, love his holiness, be his priest, and wait for the day you reign. That is a great way to finish life. Let's pray.